Hey everyone, welcome to Locked on Lakers for Wednesday. Brian Kamenetsky, Andy Kamenetsky. The Lakers lose game one in Denver, but they did, did they figure some stuff out that could help them in game two? That's next. You are Locked on Lakers. Your daily Los Angeles Lakers podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network. Your team every day. Thanks to everybody for making Locked on Lakers. First listen of every day, Monday through Friday, no matter how or where you get your podcast. It's always going to be free. It's never going to be behind a paywall. And Locked on Lakers on YouTube is where you can go to see the show and hang out with over 16,000 Lakers fans um, who are all, Andy, wondering if the Lakers have something coming Thursday that might be a little better than what we saw on Tuesday. Uh, 132 to 126 is the final score, but... um, uh, the disappointment, I think, mitigated by a strong push in the second half where the Lakers um, turned a game that was a blowout into one they actually had a chance to to tie up late in the game. So um, some encouraging signs in what looked like it was going to be a universally discouraging evening by the time it was all over. Yeah, and I, and I think it's really important to note that this was not, at least to me, a case of Denver letting up you know, like taking their foot off the gas and allowing the Lakers to get back in. This was the Lakers playing really well as the game went along, particularly in the fourth quarter, some of the adjustments that they made, some of the lineups and stuff like that. They fought Denver while Denver was still fighting to win this game. So, yeah, I would agree with that. It's one of those things where Laker fans, I doubt, feel good about the night, uh, the way it went, because ultimately there's no such thing as a throwaway game in, in the playoffs. They, it, it's funny. I did a uh, Locked on Sports today before doing this show, a segment just talking about this episode, and I was asked whether I thought this made game two a must win for the Lakers, and my response was, they're all must win. It's the playoffs. Like, they, you know, you you can get too far into the weeds of all this stuff, and some of this just turns into – you know, sports talk debate. The reality is they are all must win in the playoffs because wins in the playoffs are really hard to come by. They're precious. Um, So I don't think Laker fans feel good about tonight, but I do think there's a lot that they should still feel confident about moving forward in this series. That I think once the Lakers were playing, we'll, we'll get into the specifics of this, but the right way in this game I think they fully demonstrated they're absolutely capable of playing with Denver in this series and actually beating them. Yeah, I mean, look, I mean, Denver was up by 12 at the end of the first quarter. They were up by uh, 18 at the half um, and, you know, built that lead up into the, you know, into the 20s, you know, a a couple times over the course of the game. And, um, you know, the Lakers were a LeBron, questionable LeBron three, uh, with under a minute left from being able to tie the game. And so, you know, it was funny. Like, I I sort of looked at the second half for a little while. I was like, okay, not going to win this game, but you got to find find reasons to, you know, to, 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 to be positive for game two. Find things that work to go into game two. Find, find ways to show the Nuggets that they are. Because what I, what I thought was fascinating about the first half, Andy, is not just the way that Nikola Jokic was playing and he had – you know, six offensive rebounds in the first quarter. Um, finished with six, by the way, it should be noted. Um, and, you know, 34 points, 21 rebounds, 14 assists. And, you know, Jamal Murray had 31 on 12 of 20 shooting. Contavious Caldwell Pope, KCP, 21 points. So, you know, you look her up and down. That he yelled out score. Westbrook after every bucket. Mm-hmm. He should have. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Michael Porter Jr. played a really nice game, 15 points, 10 rebounds. You know, uh, uh, you know, he led the Nuggets in plus minus. So up and down the box score for the Nuggets, who shot 55% on the day. Um, there's plenty to like for what they did. And then it turned from, you know, you know, it, the, this thing in the first half where my biggest concern was, like, Denver was playing – Thanks in part to the confidence I think they were getting from just an otherworldly Jokic performance in the first half. But they were playing like a team, Andy, that I think believed that they were way better than the Lakers. Like, looked at them and were like, you know, we are, you know, I know that they're 
not a, a typical seven seed. And I know they've got a LeBron and AD and I know they beat us three years ago and so on and so on and so on. We think we're way better. And I think it was important for the Lakers to chip away at that, to kind of puncture that a little bit um, and not let the Nuggets keep that sort of like earn that type. I don't want to, arrogance is the wrong word, but like have that, that confidence at, at, a, at a much, much higher level. They need to put a little bit of doubt into, into Denver's minds before the game was over. And man alive, did they accomplish that. So Yeah, I mean, I, I have no doubt that Denver thinks they're the better team, and I have no problem with Denver thinking no, they're the No, the Lakers team. think they're better. Both teams right. think they're better than the other one. But yeah. you could just see, like, there's sometimes you look at it and you, and you watch a team that says, we are better than you. And we know we have a level that you guys can't match. And, you know, we're showing it to you. And we'll see if you can do anything about it. And the Lakers figured out how to match that level. Um, And I just, I think that was an important aspect of this beyond some of the matchup stuff, beyond some of the coverages and beyond some of the, the, um, the ways they approach it. Because, you know, there's, I, and we'll we'll save this for another segment or maybe even for tomorrow. But you know, so much of the playoffs is always about well, what can be repeated from game one to game two. And you know, there's a lot of happy stuff in each box score where if you're the fan of the other team or a coaching staff of the other team, you go, okay, we'll see if they can do that twice. You know, um, but I mean, I'll, I'll I'll say this: the star versus star Anthony Davis, Nikola Jokic thing that we talked about in the preview with Adam Morris uh, for uh, for Tuesday's show. Both of those guys played huge. On, yeah, like it, we got everything we wanted from that matchup. Yeah, it, it, look, I think on balance, Nikola Jokic outplayed. Anthony Davis, if that's the way you want to frame this, it, mostly on the strength of that first quarter where it took AD a little while to get going over the course of this game. And Nikola Jokic was just a monster in the first quarter. Eight points, 12 rebounds. Like he said, six on the offensive glass, five assists, two turnovers, 67% from the field. And, you know, he was – not just the best player on the floor. He looked like he was the best player to ever play NBA basketball. Well, ever. In the, ever. In like, but when, when the Ducks – And by the way, this is – what he did on Tuesday is not really that different than what he's been doing the entire playoffs. Maybe no, from but, an efficiency standpoint, um, you know, the, 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 the 12 of 17, 7 of 8 from the, from the line. But the, the broad stat lines look a lot like what he's been doing all playoffs long. Right, but that first quarter, even by his standards, was a Lulu. But no, he's on, he was on pace for like 90, 40, and 40. <laughs> right. It's, it, it's, it's important, I think, though, to point out just because sports analysis tends to be very, particularly when you're talking about star versus star and, you know, sports debate culture, it turns into pick a side. And once you pick a side, it means the other side sucks. And we got to make sure we tear down this other guy. Nikola Jokic played better than Anthony Davis in this game. But Anthony Davis played a really good game. Like it is, it is perfectly acceptable. And in this particular case, I would say actually accurate to say both stars of this team, the big men matchup that everybody was looking forward to, they are one for one in terms of showing out and being really entertaining, dominant dudes. Like it was. Anthony Davis, especially as the game went along, put as much of a stamp on this game as as Jokic did. I mean, really, the part of the problem that the Lakers were having as the game went along and AD was cooking is it took them a while to figure out a way to do this without just trading baskets. Like in the third quarter, they, they had trouble up, getting stops. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. they put up they put up thirty eight points in the third quarter, which is awesome. Until you take a look and see, oh, Denver put up thirty four. Like that, that's not going to get it done when you began the second half down 18. Um, you, you mentioned too, like the idea of what's repeatable and we, we can get into this, you know, coming up next and, you know, the, the ways that the Lakers could have chipped away at whatever degree of confidence Denver might've had, or just 
put some ideas in Denver's head. I guess the upside or the most frustrating thing about this, at least for me, looking ahead to game two and the rest of the series, is the Lakers ultimately landed on a formula that to me was totally obvious. And I have no idea how it was not just the way they began this game, specifically with going bigger to match Denver's size, as opposed to carrying over the three-guard lineup of Dennis Schroeder, D'Angelo Russell, Austin Reeves, that closed out the Warriors to great effect. And that was, you know, we talked about this. Darvin, I thought, had a terrific series as a coach um, against the Warriors, one that where, where you really started gaining confidence in what he can do during these high-stakes games. But we commented a couple times, including with Adam Mares, but also in, in a show leading up to that, we both thought that they were going to go back to a bigger lineup because yeah. it seems to me obvious that they had to. Yeah, all right. And so fact, and the hold, fact that they hold, didn't hold that thought. Hold that thought because we'll we'll get to that um, for for the next segment. Um, obviously, still a lot left to unpack um, for for this game one, and then obviously looking forward to game two. So we'll get to all that next. Locked on Lakers is brought to you by Bird Dogs, and they are the maker of shorts and pants that feature the future of comfort, which is built-in underwear stitched inside the pants or shorts, almost like a layer of boxer brief that are one with the clothing. They call it Comfort Kingdom, and you can rule this land in your Bird Dogs. You can look better, feel great while wearing the Bird Dogs. The stretchy fabrics makes my legs, and look, your legs, because I've seen them too. They need help. They make them look great, and they're comfier than... My other shorts and pants, and there's also versatility. You can wear the same bird dog pants or shorts on a golf course, a work meeting, or on a date. It's the perfect attire for grilling than sitting down and watching some sports. And also, too, this is important. They're forgiving. Give a little extra stretch in the midsection for if you need a smidge more room, nothing to be ashamed of, especially when you can still look good in the process. So go to birddogs.com slash locked on MBA. And when you enter the promo code locked on MBA, they will throw in a free custom Bird Dogs Yeti-style tumbler with every order. It looks just like this. Nice looking, huh? It's really nice looking. I've been using it today for my tea. Check it out, okay? So get yours. Get your tumbler. Get your Bird Dogs. Okay, so um, the, the Lakers, Andy, um, went with Dennis Schroeder and, um, in, in the starting lineup. <laughs> And I think the idea there was both to try to keep a little bit of a bench rotation that made kind of pattern out, you know, the way that they I mean, Lakers only played eight players in game in game one. Um, and, you know, I, I think they don't really want to play one in Gabriel a lot. I think they don't necessarily want to play Jared Vanderbilt a ton. Um, and I, I so I think they they were hoping to be able to keep Hachimura on the bench. Um, and bring him in that way, and then also to occupy both Porter and um, uh, Porter and um, Jamal Murray defensively. I think that was sort of the by playing three guards. You know, you can't the, the one of those two guys who often will hide, particularly Murray, if possible, because uh, he's a weaker defender. You have five guys on the floor that need to be guarded. I think that was the the, the idea. Um, for the reasons that you and I talked about, just you know, Mike Porter Jr. six ten, um, it it was a tricky idea. Um, it didn't work. I don't think that lineup was the only reason that the Lakers fell behind early. No, but um, it's a really damn big reason. It was. It didn't. It. I. I think it was Denver, a really big reason. In, full stop. In, in in part because I think you know Denver was having so much success on the offensive glass, which makes sense given you know what we're talking about here. But I, I mean, I, I do think one hundred percent Denver had a was at started that game at a level the Lakers weren't at. They just were not there, and um, I don't I don't think that starting Hachimura in that game. Um, and we'll get to the adjustment of who he guarded, um, but particularly if da he was if if Davis was going to start the game on Jokic, which probably would have. Um, I, I 
I'm not sure if it would have been like the thing that tilted the game, but it's very clear that they got to be careful about going small against that starting line. No, no, no. They're, they they're not, they're not going back. They're not going no, no. back there again. Yeah, there's no careful. Don't do it. Like it was a, a look. It was a bad idea going into it, and it was something. Quite frankly, if I can identify why it's a really bad idea and why it can't work. I expect Darwin Darwin has CL to identify it. And I don't disagree with you that they were looking to occupy all five of Denver's defenders or not allow Murray the out. But if you're going to do that, if that's what you're if that's what you're prioritizing, then you have to just start Rui and figure out a rotation to make it work mm-hmm. or start Vanderbilt and just really try to crank up his defensive versatility. But starting that lineup it, it didn't do enough to affect Denver's defense. But in the meantime, you're giving up all that size on the glass and they got absolutely crushed. You're also putting the Lakers defenders in size mismatches themselves. Like Michael Porter Jr. was able to go off in part because Austin Reeves was defending him really well, but still giving up five inches that it doesn't matter how well he's defending Porter – Porter can just shoot over it. And the, the, he was in a position, Reeves, where he couldn't possibly win. Mm-hmm. And you are correct that the first half, the first quarter, was not solely about the lineup. Like, it is not Darvin Ham's fault that the Lakers were god-awful getting back in transition on defense. They were terrible. That is not on Darvin Ham. That is on the and they were in the the relative sloppy. And they weren't finished with seven turnovers in the night, but they were still sloppy in the first quarter. They just weren't. They were not nearly as sharp as Denver. But they were also put in a Mm -hmm. decided disadvantage on both sides of the ball in ways that again were incredibly predictable. And for sure, if I'm sorry, if you ask me the if I had to say the number one reason, sorry. (laughs) <laughs> whatever if you have to ask me the number one reason that i think they lost this game it's because i think they were put behind the eight mm-hmm. ball with that decision in a big way and then on top of it this is the other reason that i'm putting it the number one factor on that lineup you could see this was not going to work and they didn't adjust it in the second half and just come out with a different lineup i would maybe give it a pass if you wanted to try to see what it could do to open the game. But once you saw how big of a disaster it was to open the game, to not just switch it to start the second half, that's mismanagement. It just that is. To me, that to me was the bigger mistake of the two because um, you, know, you, you, you saw – and it didn't work particularly well at the beginning of the third quarter either. Um, no. And no, it that, did not. That, that to me was the, the part where you look at now. This – Let's let's focus on what worked when they when they made some of these changes. Well, the big thing that they did wasn't just that they put um, Hachimura in the game and just went larger. It's that they changed up their coverages and for big chunks of Rui's twenty eight minutes that he played, he actually guarded Jokic. Um, we in guarded the pre- him by himself. <laughs> in the preview, Often. we talked a lot about ways to get Anthony Davis off of Jokic because while there are going to be times when you'd want him bodying up him and match up one-on-one and all that kind of stuff, it limits the Lakers defensively when you do that because it it, it pulls him, you know, Jokic is such a good three-point shooter and he's so good in the high pick and roll and all that. Like, he's fine. He can pull you away from the basket and do all that kind of stuff. And, and he just takes, occupies you, period. Right. Like, you can't do anything else if you're guarding If Jokic. you're guarding Nikola Jokic, your job is to guard Nikola Jokic. And, you know, if you, if you turn your head just a little bit, if you try to shade off of him or something when somebody and you go help, he's going to be there for an offensive board, whatever it is. Um, and the Lakers operate best – when Anthony Davis can cheat a little bit, play off of his man, provide a real sense of help defense and rim protection and, and all that kind of stuff. And so by moving Hachimura onto Jokic, it frees up Davis to do more stuff. And I think that was really effective. The other thing that I thought it did 
Um, and this is where I want to get in for the next segment, kind of thinking about, okay, what do you do for game two? Like when you think about the counter to the counter to the counter to the counter, all these other things in, by the way, again, both teams played eight players. So, you know, these are going to be tight rotations with the same players probably having to play big minutes to me. The, um, the Nuggets got away from using Jokic as a fulcrum for everything that they were <laughs> it's doing. It's funny, actually, by the way, you know, we talked about, you know, eight players and we, we had talked with Adam about the idea of whether or not Mike Malone and Darvin Ham would look to mirror Nikola Jokic and Anthony Davis with each other, you know, pair up their minutes. They both played 42 minutes in this game. So, so far, that answer is yes. <laughs> yes, they will. As, as we both expected, they would. I, I mean, it, the ideal time for either one of them to be off the court um, that doesn't, I guess, doesn't involve foul trouble um, is when one of them's sitting. That's when you sit the other one. Yeah. But I, I imagine most of the time when one of them is playing, the other one's going to be playing. Yeah. And so the, the, so here, here's the other thing I thought Denver did that, you know, I think had a huge impact is that when, when Anthony Day, at the beginning of the game, they were going through Jokic at the top of the key. They're doing all kinds of stuff. The minute when they put Hachimura on him, and this happens all the time, then they started using, looking at Jokic purely as a scorer. Look, here's a mismatch that we have to exploit. And they drop down and he'd post up and he'd wait for the double and he'd do all that kind of stuff. And it, it, you know, Denver had this nice free flowing offense at the beginning of the game that got mucked up, I think, because they were looking towards that matchup as something that they could exploit. Oh, well, let's let Joker go to work. So I, I after the break, two things. First, what did you see? Second, do you think this alignment where you can put Hachimura on Jokic for significant stretches of games is sustainable. So we'll get to all that next. So quick reminder, Thursday night Lakers uh, game two in Denver. Um, you can catch the action. On, that's at 530. You can catch the action on Sirius XM. Use the SXM app uh, and search Lakers. They did not. It's a very tongue twistery kind of uh, of app that they came up with there. Much easier to type than it is to say. Um, I Hachimura had four fouls or five fouls in four, I believe. Four, yeah. Yep. So, I mean, I, I think three were in the first half, right? Um, I one of the things that I think that is really fascinating and come out of this game is okay if the Lakers try to put Hachimura on. Jokic for significant portions of the of the series is that sustainable like is like I said I I saw them sort of change the way that they were doing their offense in ways that they that weren't beneficial to them um, did you uh, see something similar to that no I actually okay. saw the opposite uh Jokic took fewer shots in the second half and in the second quarter than he did in the first half um so I don't think they were looking to get more no but it was it was less of him it, it looked to me like it was less of him at the top of the key and more of him with his back to the basket and all that kind of stuff and it's still you know passing still whatever but it, it was it was a little different than it, than it was in the first half i mean in i guess in certain respects i, mean, I didn't way, i mean i could be wrong I, I, I didn't i didn't sit there and chart every play so no no but i'm just telling you he took fewer shots um in as the game went along and certainly in the fourth mm -hmm. quarter i think what was happening was he was having he was having less success getting to his spots because Rui's strong. Rui's a really strong guy, and we we talked about this with Adam. Like one of the things that we learned from seeing Hachimura now on a game in game out basis that was surprising because, to put it generously, uh, politely, he had a terrible defensive reputation in D.C. And that was one of the questions we had when they brought him over. Like, okay, we can see how he's going to be useful offensively. And this team can really use the stuff that he can do on that side of the ball. What's going to happen with him when it comes to playing defense? Can he be out on the court? And what's become apparent is 
if you put him in one-on-one matchups, assuming it's not somebody that's just that much faster than him, he's actually pretty effective because he's strong. He's very big. He's athletic. He can't. He, he, that's why he was effective in the in the first round and ineffective right. in the second. Because exactly. what he can't do is run around chasing Clay Thompson off of screens. No, no, that was a. I, I don't think Rui played badly against the Warriors. It just wasn't a good series. It wasn't a good matchup for him. Hmm. But like for example, in the fourth quarter, there were back to back possessions where Jokic was looking to to back down to you know go for the type of layups that he had gone after even with like Anthony Davis guarding him and he did it more slowly because he couldn't get as much movement against Rui and it allowed AD to swoop in from behind for a weak side block the next the next play Jokic was backing down uh Hachimura and I think Rui got him uncomfortable enough that it hurt the accuracy of a pass that he was trying to make along the baseline and he turned it over like I, well, I, honestly I think, think the Rui. other thing there too is the awareness. If when Hachimura is when he's backing down Hachimura, he also has to be aware of Davis. Sure. Whereas if Davis is guarding him, you don't have to be aware of anybody else. You know who the guy is, and so I, I right. think that's part of it too. Yeah, but I, I think I think Rui was very effective in mm-hmm. a type of role that I think he can do. Like do do I think he can you know quote unquote shut down oh, God, Nikola no. Jokic for four to seven. No, because nobody can. <laughs> like nobody can do that. But do I think that this is something that the Lakers can use as a means of trying to make Jokic work, try to make him uncomfortable and allow AD to spend more time in that defensive rover back role? Yes, because it's something I expected them to do Heading into this series. Right. And I I think, right. uh, Yeah. We talked about it. And the key, I think, with it was as it was with Steph in the first round, you know, with Jokic going forward is is to limit the and games where Jokic scores 34 and he has 14 assists. Where, you know, where (laughs) his and was everything in this. Right. And part of the problem, though, too, with Jokic is his normal line is essentially a triple double. Um, You know, I mean, he is. I mean, the, you can make a solid. I mean, a guy averaged 25, 12, and 10 this year. Um, you know, in the, in the postseason, 31, 13, and 10. Yeah. I mean, my God. <laughs> um, so, you know, it, it's, it, it is hard to shut that down. Well, I but, mean, he's going to you know, get but, his in the same way LeBron and AD are going to get theirs, and probably Jamal Murray's going to get his because Jamal well, but that's but, but yes and no. And I think, you know, the, you can get, you know, if Jokic has a 12, what was it, 12 19 today? Uh, 12 17, even better. Um, you know, 12 of 17 with 14 assists is deadly, particularly if Murray's going to get his 31 on 20 shots. It's like, you know, the Lakers, and, and look, the Nuggets are, you know, in their locker room saying the same thing, you know, like, okay, you know, we gave up 26 to LeBron on 16 shots, we gave up 40 to AD. On twenty three, you know both both LeBron and AD twenty three to Austin Reeves on fourteen shots, seventeen right. to Rui on eleven shots. Right, like you know both teams shot fifty five percent. Like neither yeah. team was really able to get stops. And I was that's when I was sitting there watching this game, going, I was fairly encouraged in the second half. Going, okay, you know what? They're going to they've discovered some stuff offensively that they'll be very confident in going in with game two because it wasn't super fluky. It wasn't, you know, Neo Delo and, and Schroeder were kind of non-factors. Um, Schroeder, Schroeder in the fourth quarter played well defensively. Schroeder, but I mean, Schroeder I mean, I mean offense. I just meant, I just meant a score. Yes, you are correct. Um, you are correct. And Delo was not particularly good period. No, he was not. Um, this could be a challenging series for him, but we'll see. We'll, well maybe that's something we'll talk about um, for, this is one uh, of those there's nowhere to hide him series at all. No. If you're concerned about that. No. Um, and he, he sometimes he needs a little hiding. Um, and, you know, so, but but what they needed to do was show that they get to get, get, get some stops. And all of a sudden you kind of look up and it's like they've moved past, found a, a couple encouraging things that they can take into game two into they they might win. Like, I, I I just I think making the last four minutes of this game 
really difficult for for Denver, making Denver play all the way through the tape in a game where, like you said, I think I think Denver got a little bit less. Um, I think their attention to detail was not quite, yeah, but, but they didn't let up. They didn't stop playing. They didn't start lengthening the rotation. They just, you know, maybe weren't. But they were also otherworldly sharp at the beginning of the game. That's hard to sustain throughout. Um, the, you could have left game one really concerned that the Lakers had a huge gap to make up to make this a long series. By the time it was over, I understand they lost game one. I understand game two is going to be a real challenge up in Denver and all that stuff. Nothing in my mind about how tight and competitive a series this should be changed after game one. And I think that is actually a pretty encouraging sign for the Lakers. Yeah. Uh, one last thing I think is worth pointing out just because there, there are a lot of more dominant storylines, I think, for the specifics of this game. LeBron had a really nice game. Like a questionable three-pointer. Really questionable. The, yeah. Really um, questionable. I, not a good Under a minute decision. left, Lakers down three. LeBron, who had been destroying the Nuggets going downhill, which, by the way, we thought could be, be the thing. And actually, um, he had he had a lot of company in that regard as well. A lot of well, guys on the, the team. Nuggets are not a good rim-protecting team. Um, that no. is, you know, defensively, they're – I mean, they were, you know, top 10-ish – Top ten adjacent, I think, you know, defensive efficiency this year, but their strength was not that. They were you know, one of the worst teams in the league, um, giving up points from a percentage standpoint at the rim, and so that is where the Lakers need to attack. Um, you know, they they were eleven of twenty four from three point range, which was nice, um, but you know, LeBron was just he was going down. There was so much time left in that game. And a bucket there would have been nice, and he went for the, da- the the tying three, and that was that was their last best chance to to tie the game up. Right. Oh. But you know, on balance, twenty six points yeah. on great. nine of sixteen shooting, eight of eleven from the line, twelve rebounds, nine assists, a block. I thought really, really good defensive energy. LeBron was actually in that first half when the Lakers, as a whole, were frankly embarrassing in their transition defense. I thought LeBron was one of the few guys that actually was, for the most part, making a pretty concerted effort to get back. Like, it actually jumped out at me because, you know, old man LeBron is one of the few guys actually hustling. In yeah, that just, they, they were ju- – I don't totally understand why. Uh, you know, the lineup contributed to the the sort of mechanical stuff that was happening on the floor – and they just they Denver oh, yeah, that's was, not on Darwin. No, that's not Denver on. was up at a level, you know, to start this game in terms of their attention to detail, in terms of their focus, in terms, you know, the Lakers, I thought, spent too much time, you know, looking, you know, looking for whistles and you know, just say Boy, Jared I, Vanderbilt I, is not going to be sending these three refs uh um, no. fruit baskets. It just they 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 weren't quite I, I, you know, they got punched in the mouth uh, in, to use the uh, sporting parlance and had to had to work their way back. And they did, to their credit, yeah. uh, but obviously need a better start on Thursday. Locked on Lakers on YouTube is where you can go to see the show, hang out with uh, – getting where are we? How are we getting close to 17? We, we should be at 17,000 by the time people hear this show at the rate these subscriptions are climbing, the subscribers, I should say – we should be, nay, we will be at 17,000. Calling it now. If you do your part, you can help send. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, so yeah, there we go. Yeah, 16.9. So we're getting, we're real close. So um, yeah, you hang out with that crew. You leave some questions, leave some comments. We'll try to work them into shows over the course of the rest of the week. Uh, game two, obviously is again Thursday night. You can catch that on the Sirius X uh Sirius XM on the SXM app. Search Lakers 530 Pacific um is is the game time every game in this series 530. And we'll see everybody tomorrow.